Hello, everyone. Welcome to Q&A with A and V. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me tonight from New York, Amy Rosenfeld. Hi, Amy. Hi, Vincent. How are you today? I'm well. This is my third live stream. Yeah, so? It means I'm well. How are you? I like your bright orange sweater. Amazing. It's kind of tangerine. It just looks, I don't know why it looks orange now. I want to give an update on the incubator. What do you think? Sure. So, uh, I have three pictures to show everyone. This one was taken last week, which shows you uh, the main area. So, this is our new table that... Um, I, uh, it's 96 inches long, which Amy said we need to get. And it's solid wood, and she helped me pick it out. And uh, that is where I'll do all the recording and streaming. And then we have the problematic windows, which are right now just temporarily covered with uh, sound blankets. And then a uh, editing station here. Now, this past uh, weekend, Amy... <clears throat> um, where is the other one? Amy, uh, no, that's not it. <laughs> Amy came into the studio with me and helped me put up these um, sound panels for the interview area. And, and as you can see, uh, they form a pseudo capsid, right? <laughs> yes, yes. And now finally, I have a uh, more a recent overview. This is a this is quite a picture. It's a panorama, so I have to scan it. So here. We have the left side of the studio, and there is... Um, Wait, you the... brought out the vacuum? You vacuumed? Of course. Actually, today I vacuumed. Everything's vacuumed? all vacuumed. Yeah, I did. Really? <laughs> there's, the, there's the interview area. So this is what I see from my desk here, this monitor here uh, below the camera, and then um, interview area. And then I move the editing desk. I don't know that Amy has seen this. I, I thought it was better here in this little alcove, which is lined with uh, sound blankets. And then uh, there's the the doorway is over here to escape. Uh, but all these sound panels, everything was was help was picked out and helped put up and everything. What do you think? Do you like it? I think it a looks of, good. A lot of wires. I, I vacuumed it. You don't like the dirty rugs? I like vacuumed. Okay, it's vacuum. This morning, the first thing I did when I got in before virology, I put together the metal shelves in the closet, put all the stuff on them that was lying around on the floor, then I vacuumed, and then I did a live stream. Apparently, the vacuum cleaner matches your sweater. It's Sounds kind of good. It's a small uh, it's a small vacuum cleaner. Okay, so with that, let's uh, jump into uh, thanks to all the moderators tonight, Frank P., uh, Les Fabi, Mr. Ozzy Cam, um, Vanity Nutrition, and Steph S.F. These guys are troopers. They were here this morning, too. That's good. Um, <clears throat> this guy is three plaques to the wind. That's just great. Isn't that three plaques to the wind? All right, That's Matt. Good. The FDA vaccine committee was asking for correlates of protection data last week. When do you think we will have the evidence? When people do the right studies. <clears throat> yes. It's very difficult to do. I don't know if we'll ever have it, in, frank, in fact. Are you familiar with Siddhartha Mukherjee from Colombia? I understand he's partnering an mRNA vaccine to target cancer. There is a live talk tomorrow with Washington Post. I am familiar with him. I've read The Emperor of All Maladies. I've never spoken a word to him. Once I sent him an email saying what he had said about influenza virus in the press was wrong, and he never answered. Some colleague, huh? I've seen him uh, on the elevator. I read the book. Um, he's not really... I wouldn't have used the word pioneering because... Moderna is actually a company that started off as making an mRNA vaccine against cancer and it didn't work out so well. And then mm -hmm. the pandemic occurred and they took that same technology to make the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. So 
it really is bothersome that he's claiming credit for pioneering. When he didn't pioneer, he probably parasited. Parasitized. What's the antigen in the mRNA? Do you know? Uh, well, it depends on what cancer you're targeting. Okay, so they're different. Got it. Okay, Steph. Well, Steph has a new picture. Why? Why do you put a leaf there? Is it because Maybe it's, it's Halloween. No, maybe because it's Halloween next week. Mix and match vaccine therapy given green light by Vincent, Amy, and Daniel <laughs> weeks, month ago. Approved by FDA today. It was Amy. Amy gets everything yes. right. Yes, that was me like four months ago. <laughs> Seems that most of the FDA panel's words were not really in favor of boosting, but their votes were. Yeah, isn't that something? <laughs> no, it's all politics. It's the same thing. The president says one thing and he votes for another. No, it's all the same. We don't need boosters. But No, but whatever. I'm tired of having this debate. The only and thing stuff. The only thing, Amy, that I'm really not happy is if Columbia makes a booster required for us to go to work, then I'm gonna be pissed. Uh, I haven't seen any I haven't heard anything about that. I'm just saying, in case that happens Well they can't because number one, six it's only advocated for sixty five and above. And only for people who are, if they're under that, if they have a risk factor or if they're in a danger, like in the line of fire. Um, and you have an entire undergraduate campus. None of them are yeah. in the line of fire. And half of, I would, ha I would assume that 60% of the population down there is under 65 since they have a ton of undergraduates. I would assume the undergraduates mm. outnumber the professors, what, 500 to 1? Yeah, but there are a number of us over 65. Yeah, so it's optional. Good. Like, Ian got it, but you don't have to do it. Uh, do you think kids under 12 should be vaccinated? Yes. Yeah. Kid, young kids are making up many, many infections, or they have in the past weeks. And, you know, they get sick less rarely, seriously sick, as Daniel says, but not zero. So you don't want your kid to get very sick, right? Not only that, but they're, they're transmitters. I mean, it's not in the, what respiratory disease does not come with a snotty-nosed kid? I used to be a snotty-nosed kid. We all used to be snotty-nosed kids. Did That's I order a new back? Book Pro. Yes, I did. I did because, and I sold my old one, which I have right here to pay for it, but I need more ports. And so I've been waiting for that for a while. I actually ordered it on the train, Amy. Wow, very efficient. Let's see. <laughs> What's with this new COVID variant I'm hearing about? AY.4.2. What do you know about that, Amy? It's not a Greek letter. How do I know anything about it? It's not a Greek letter. When it becomes a Greek letter, call me. Today on Tuivo, Nails showed a picture of all the Delta subvariants that have spun off, you know, well, slightly different changes. It's, he said it's out of control. We're looking too closely. Uh, so basically, the guy who just won a Hughes and a MacArthur Genius is now echoing something that I said in the spring. Okay. And I, have I don't no know if he, money. I don't know if he I knows no what you said. Money. So this is good. This, I'm feeling really secure about this now. Amy, the world is not fair. Fair. You'll, you'll yeah, get your grant money. I understand. I'm just saying. Why are pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic cases classified in the same category? The form of well, How do you disease? tell the difference? Um, I don't know. They're what not do two different species. Well, a pre-symptomatic eventually will have some symptoms, right? How do you know that? Well, then it would be asymptomatic, right? Could be. This is a, these are people who have been studied for a while, and they say they were pre-symptomatic, and then 
they develop disease. Anyway, I don't know what you mean by classified in the same category. With respect to what? Being infected by SARS-CoV-2, of course. I'm not sure what the question is. Do you, Amy? No, and I'm not sure why, why I care about pre-symptomatic. Pre-symptomatic is like you and me. We're pre-symptomatic. That's a really term. good pick of Amy. What's the picture? Did I show a picture? No, I, I didn't. I don't know. I didn't I show know. one. I don't think I was in the picture. I took can a I good picture. Can Can I switch from the digital Pfizer to the analog J and J? That's funny. Yes. Sure. You can. You can do the switch. Yeah, it's no problem. As Amy said months ago, it's no problem. And now it's exactly. no problem. Waste hmm. of thousands of dollars. How will molnupiravir affect the legion of benign and helpful viruses which cohabit our bodies? Well, not all of them have an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Yeah. Most phage are not RNA-dependent RNA polymerases. They're DNA. Mm -hmm. And what about this? the RNA viruses that we harbor? Some might be affected, some might not. It's not right. clear. Uh, it's an interesting question, but I'm not sure anyone will look at it. Why? You know, they want to make a pandemic preparedness and an antiviral plan. I can imagine it coming up in our meeting next week. Or actually, we don't do antiviral drugs in the meeting that Carla really wanted to have. Did you see the article that stated J and J fell to three percent? I didn't see that at all. I don't think that's right, is it, Amy? I don't know. I didn't see the article, but I highly doubt that it fell to three to three to percent. That's ridiculousness. Vanity says, "Great news about the FBA approval for mix and match." They they didn't talk to Amy, but they followed her advice, right? Yes. I don't know. I what is his name? Peter Marks? Is that the guy? Yes. Yes, He's Peter the Marks. official guy who makes the signing, or is it the Woodstock lady? Well, Peter Marks is, is the head of. Uh, is that it just head of vaccine? Vaccine, yeah. I don't know if it's just him or if it's the whole shebang person. I just don't know. Thank you, Joe, for your contribution. Hello from Southern California. I still think you need to move the camera closer to you for the twist. I'm like this. You want closer than this? Well, I, no. The thing is, is the twists aren't done here in your home in your home basement. The twists are done in the incubator. So this is not a particularly helpful comment for right now. For I maybe that, one day, uh, when you're in the incubator, that you know, and you have what's his name, David, isn't it? His name, David, the helper. The editor? Yeah, David. His name? David, yeah. David. Yeah. Maybe he'll come one day and the two of you will work together and he could assign, he yeah. could move the cameras. Yeah. So, um, you know, set it up it, and blah, blah, blah. Still a work in progress. By the way, Daniel supposedly is coming tomorrow to do his update at the incubator. Well, that's very exciting. He's never been since we've yeah. furnished it. Yeah. <laughs> So which is that a table, euphemism for 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 stuff. That table, no, that's not the table. That table is big enough for both of us to sit next to each other. I have to push this stuff over a bit, but it'll be good. I can even put so three people. Sitting, me, da me, Daniel, and Dixon could be at the end. Yeah. You're sitting I've, side by side, or are you sitting the way you had it when you had David Teller last week? I'm gonna sit side by side. I didn't like the Teller angle. We weren't looking at the camera. Well, just move the camera. And I have to bring this camera in tomorrow because I don't have another one at the incubator yet. So Did after you order? This, no. Why? I, I didn't order. Why? Should I get another camera? I'm sorry. What? I no, cannot I process that you did not go to B and H when you decided that you needed a second camera. I can, what can what is the self control? No B and H in the afternoon. Yeah, it's, you know, it's a pain to go to B and H, even though it's convenient. It takes an hour because it's a twenty minute walk, and then you have to wait in line, and the line's really long. It's amazing how many people are picking up electronic stuff, and then 
It's another 20 minute walk back, but I'll go. I'll go get it. I need to get another monitor and some other things, but I can't Wait, get them all at once. You just ordered a monitor. You it just didn't show up. That, you just didn't told me that up. Amazon emailed you and said that it was delivered. It's not there. I went to the freight elevator. It's not outside the door. I don't know where it is. So basically, it's in the same ambiguous cloud, nebulous cloud, as the sound blankets are. Is that what you're telling me? That's very frustrating. Yeah. What's the latest on correlates of immunity? We don't know. There's nothing new after the article we did on TWIV a few weeks ago where they estimated it's based on statistical procedures and based on Level seen they didn't in all the even factor in T cells. So. No, they didn't. Nope. There are a lot of talk about RNA vaccines being used to fight cancer. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> Women around the world are impressed you vacuumed. Yeah, men too. I vacuum often at this incubator because unpacking boxes makes a lot of trash. That's why I made. That's why I bought a vacuum cleaner. You know. I was actually vacuuming in today, and I said, what am I doing? <laughs> and then I said, I'm vacuuming. You got out the vacuum. You plugged it in. You're pushing it around <laughs> on the floor, and you say, what are you doing? Yeah, I mean, I said I should go pick papers for TWIV, right? Amy, did you choose the colors for the sound panels as like the color scheme? Yes, right? Mm -hmm. Amy chose all the colors and the furniture as well. <laughs> the first person to create viable recombinant virus for his polio research, and he's putting up soundproofing and vacuuming. That's okay. I'm just a person. And and yes, we have 100,000 subscribers on YouTube. Isn't that cool? It it's it's like 100,700 now. We're about to hit 101,000. Oh, by the way, so I got I, when you go into the YouTube dashboard where I control all my videos, this message came up. Please claim your award by copying this number and going to the next screen. There was no number. And then I went to the next screen and there was no number and then it went away. So I'm never going to get my award. I'm so sad. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> you have Google. Wait a minute. You have Google Sync this weekend with Jack. You've missed the last two. Why don't you go talk to Jack? Uh, I tried to talk to Jack about getting the money out, but he didn't even answer me. You emailed him. You never follow up. What percent of natural infection immunity is as good or as better than vaccine? Is it, if it's very high, then is it even worth saying it's heterogeneous? <laughs> Amy and I disagree on this, so I'm going to let her take it. <laughs> Amy thinks the that vaccination that immunity is just as heterogeneous as infection immunity, well, right? Well, it is, for sure. Absolutely. It's totally so ridiculous to say that that it's totally ridiculous the other way. It's to, it's the stupidest thing, and it just shows that people don't understand genetics and population genetics. And uh, if you wanted to be truthful, then more the latest research has shown that natural and that the immunity you get from being infected. Is actually better than the vaccine because you get a more, if you are only interested in antibodies, the breadth of antibodies is much greater than with a vaccine. And mm -hmm. today there was a paper that talked about it being in the germline. I sent it to you and Dan. yeah, I saw that. I was looking at that and considering it for TWIV Friday. Yes, because oh, I already brought this up, and you said to me, "No, no, 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 couldn't be in the germline because we had never been exposed before." Lo and behold. Uh, Amy likes to point out when I'm wrong, too. <laughs> I don't like to point it out. I'm just saying. It's okay. Don't be, don't pick on me and make it sound like I'm mean and nasty to you. That's not nice. It's not fair. <laughs> I'm not picking on you at all. Yes, you are. You're playing the victim for sure. All right. All right. All right. So let me just get a summary from you. Infection is better. Immunity, antibody immunity after infection is as good or better than vaccination. Yes. And so now people are going to ask you, why should I get vaccinated then? Why don't I just get COVID? Because the side effects of COVID infection are too risky. Why would you want to potentially die? Okay, that's good. I like that answer. All right, Eddie wants to know, 
Do you think boosters so far a recommendation rather than a must, i.e. you don't get a booster, you are at risk for severe COVID, even if fully vaxxed? I don't think the IE is correct. No, I agree. I don't think there's any evidence that no. you're, you're at risk for severe if you don't get a third shot. It's a speculation on their part. And Amy it's says you don't need it, folks. Just mark my words. In six months, someone will say we didn't need boosters after all. Amy will be vindicated. Um, so, you know, Oliver was here today. Oh, really? How is Oliver? Uh, very funny. Very funny. Okay. <laughs> and so we were discussing the boosters and, and stuff. And mm -hmm. Oliver fully, so Oliver fully agreed. So Oliver brought up this study about like, you know, some prisoner study or something or other. And like that there was like 33% of the prisoners who were vaccinated got infected and developed mild symptoms or whatever. And 87% or something or other of uninfect, un unvaccinated prisoners, you know, developed severe disease, blah, blah, blah. I said, so how did they decide that they, you were infected? Was this a one snot sh shot or what? <laughs> one and snot he shot. said, yeah. And he said, yeah. I said, well, you know, that's not really infection. You know, you walk into a room, you get exposed, it binds to some cells. And then you go 10 minutes later, you take your test and you come out positive. Like, you know, you have to do you have to do like a six week period where everybody uh, gives a sample every day in order to determine. And then he's like, oh yeah, that's a, that is right. And I was like. <laughs> uh, here, this is uh, one for you. Is there a blood test that could show if an individual has been exposed to COVID without confusing infection induced and vaccine induced antibodies? If you look for N. Yeah, you look for antibodies to the N protein, which is not present in the vaccines here in the U.S. Is it yep. present in the vaccines in Europe? If somebody, if some country is using an activated vaccine from China, yeah, right. I didn't know anybody outside of China was using that, but I'm not I think really so. keeping. Well, I'm not really keeping track. Well, I said if I don't know for sure. Yeah, I'm not really keeping So Judy says, if I got my second jab in April, what approximately would be my efficacy? <laughs> no, Judy, you're not a vaccine. You don't have efficacy. <laughs> Does it get lower as the months pass? Well, efficacy against what? Well, first of all, it is effectiveness because you're not in a clinical trial, but that's pedantic. Uh, you want to know what would be your protection against what? Infection, mild disease, moderate, severe death? I would say... And I think Amy would agree with me that your protection against severe disease and death is in the 90th percentile. What do you think, Amy? Oh, for sure. I'm just wondering, what is moderate and severe? <laughs> Those are the words that are bandied about. I know. Yeah, I don't really understand. Let's just say mild, severe, and death. How's that? Three categories. Yeah, I... I this moderate thing is iffy. So it's kind of like when I did these urine, these incontinence studies when I was doing microbiome work. And yeah. they would say like, they would be testing drugs and, and they would say there would be, you know, a mild, a moderate effect of the drug or a traumatic effect of the drug. And I was like, well, if I go to the bathroom 15 times a day and taking this drug now cuts it down to nine times a day, if you talk to my mom, that's like a tremendous, that's a great, great, you know, wonder drug. Mm -hmm. If you talk to her sister and you, that drug sucks. I still go to the bathroom far too often. So it's very I subjective. Know. It's a, it depends how you define it. I totally agree. By the way, Amy, um, Realistic says that Columbia used vaccines from Russia and China at the beginning. I don't know if one oh. of them was inactivated. The Russian is, of course, Sputnik. Yeah, well, you know. All right, Amy, what, what, if anything, has surprised you regarding SARS-CoV-2 vaccines since they were introduced late last year? What do you think, Amy? <laughs> it's not going to be good. <laughs> what surprised you? 
so what surprised me is how scientists have, and especially virologists, have misinterpreted the data and um, this whole discussion about boosters and waning immunity and efficacy and gotten confused. Um, mm -hmm. The whole, yeah, the whole story about, you know, the vaccine going from it protects against infection to it not protecting against infection to, oh my God, if you get a booster protected against infection, and then tomorrow we'll find out, no, you're not protected against infection even when you get a boost. So I think that the vaccines are wonderful technologically and they're a great public health tool, but I think that they have, they've been abused in an intellectual fashion. Yeah. Okay. What would you um, say? Oh, you want me to say to? something? I can't well, say the same thing as you, right? You can say the same thing as me. Yeah, sure. I, I won't just so that we give people a broader sense. And I, I don't know, surprised in a good way or a bad way. So Amy was surprised in a bad way, right? The, the amount of misinformation. Um, well, I think I, that, the, you know, I think that they're really great. Like it's a great technological yeah, advance. No, it's great. I think, um, uh, what am I, I, I'm surprised, I guess, that these variants, um, they apparently have reduced neutralization, although Amy's going to tell me, how, how do you know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> You're right. They still are controlled by the T-cell response. And so I'm I shouldn't be surprised. That I'm not even clear that they're really reduced neutralization. Uh, there's no standard test. There's no, no. standard amount you of virus. You know, there's you no me, nothing. You sent me a bunch of papers where they say the neutralization of this sera versus this variant is reduced. They're you send me these papers, right? Yeah, I send them to you so you're up to date about what is going on so you don't stick your foot in your mouth. Amy says, my best interest in mind. I guess what I'm surprised is that they made them so fast. I'm amazed. Okay, that's that's really what I'm surprised at. Yeah, but I, I also think that it's a technology that is not going to be applicable to everything. Yes, for sure. Like, you could not apply this, really, to Pocornas. You couldn't make an mRNA vaccine against picornaviruses? Well, how would you do it if you, if you said the capsid proteins are, are equivalent to spike? Right? You'd have to include a protease. Right. And the protease is problematic, right? Mm-hmm. Is it bad that I want Vincent on Joe Rogan? No, it's fine. Some people don't. Some people do. Amy says I should. <clears throat> For sure. One person said today, don't go. He will warp everything you say. I think you should have more confidence that I cannot get warped. <laughs> Amy has trained me for many years, right? <laughs> get warped? What are you, a piece of wood out in the wet? I've been enjoying your live podcast. I was wondering to what extent RDRP is a window into the RNA world if cells don't have them. Okay. Tell them well, what you uh, tell them in your class. The RNA world existed before anything else on Earth in terms of molecules. And RDRP eventually evolved to copy those molecules. So it's a window on the evolution of, of life on the planet, for sure. And cells have RNA. And even though there's no RDRP, you still learn about how RNA is copied and so forth. So, but I think the evolutionary bent is the most important, right? Wouldn't the efficacy of immunity from natural infection decrease over time? Why would it be any different? Well, I've never heard of efficacy of immunity. But it's, it's just being brief because he doesn't have many characters to, to type out. You only have 200 characters in a comment. So oh. he's being brief. So okay. what's the yeah, antibodies levels always decrease, but B cells, memory B cells are always there, or at least you hope so. And so I don't see any difference between infection and vaccination in terms of memory B cells. Shouldn't be any different. I agree. 
My middle school science teacher is trying to turn everyone into a ribosome. He is giving us worksheets where we transcribe DNA to RNA, but the problem is I'm not a ribosome. The problem that's great. Is that, that's true, but the problem is is that transcribing RNA in, DNA into RNA is not what the ribosome does. That's what the polymerase does. The ribosome takes RNA into protein, into amino acids. It's translation. It's a totally different language. I love this idea that that the teacher wants to turn them into ribosomes, though. Isn't that great? I think it's great, but we're but that's not that's not what a ribosome does. A ribosome makes RNA into protein, right? It translates it into a different code, into an amino acid code. Hmm. It's the would only a, thing that can translate. Would a Pfizer booster increase memory cells? I mean, a third shot? I don't think so. I think after the second, uh, you have the, all the memory T cells you're going to have, right? Yeah. For those concerned about long COVID, what do you think the real risk of that is from the data we have so far? Do you expect the therapeutics to have an effect in reducing that risk? The therapeutics, meaning the uh, the oral antivirals that are coming on, presumably. Can we assume that, Amy? Sure. Well, I think it depends when you take them. If you take them early on an infection, then they may eliminate long COVID because you will have no, and you won't have a, a long infectious process. You won't have cytokine storms and so forth. So it may take care of it, but we don't know until we, we do the experiment, right? Yeah. If you get infected, unvaccinated, but get monoclonals, will your antibodies be less broad than if you got COVID without treatment or do natural infection studies account for treatments? It depends if when you, you get, get the antibodies, if, right? If you get infected, but get... Monoc no. Then you get monoclonal so therapies. The thing is, is if you get infected and you get monoclonals, you don't make any antibodies. That's the whole point. Well, it depends when you get the monoclonals, right? If you get them in hospital, it's too well, late and you've already made antibodies. Nobody gets a, a monoclonals in the hospital. They get them before. They get uh, them within former, the first 10 days. Former president did. Yeah, well, no, it's not clear when, actually when he got the monoclonals. Because he... But Amy, yeah, li listen to this. And you've told me this. Some virus goes in your nose, begins to right. reproduce. You feel sick after a few days. You get tested. You get monoclonal. So the virus has been reproducing. So you have some right. antibody production, right? Right. right. So it's I not think zero. That, Right, but I think the monoclonals, I think people have misinterpreted what the monoclonals do. Uh, why don't you explain it then? Well, so you just said that you get infected, you, you, the virus reproduces, you get some symptoms, which usually are after the peak of replication, right? And yeah. then you go and get mono, and then you go and get monoclonals. So the monoclonals like sop up you know, they're supposed to like be that gap between when your immune system kicks in and when you, uh, from that point of replication, right? Of yes, yeah, yes. reproduction to when your immune system kicks in. So they're like a supplement, right? It's kind of like yeah. more thought, it should be more looked at as like it's a supplement. And so you, no, your antibodies won't be less broad because you've already started to go on the process of antibody okay. of making the antibodies. Got it. Got it. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So it doesn't really interrupt. It shouldn't really interrupt that. It should just make it much less efficient. Do natural infection studies account for treatments? I don't, I don't know what you mean. I don't but know what that statement means. If you're in a trial of some kind, they're not going to have you if they give you monoclonals. No. All right. After mRNA vaccination, how long is the innate immune system likely to be doing much of anything? Zero. That's why they modified the mRNA with pseudouracil. It doesn't get tr it doesn't trigger the innate immune system. That's right. how it works. Right. So your your innate immune system isn't doing anything. That's right. It's stagnant. 
I've, uh, oh, this is why Steph put a leaf on her face because she stumped out a lot of trolls. Okay. Uh, very clever. Very clever. Uh, why do vaccinated individuals still have to isolate for 10 days? Shouldn't it be shorter? Is anyone studying this? Should be zero. Yeah, I agree. You shouldn't have to. The number of vaccinated people who are transmitting is probably infinitesimally small, but no one's actually proven it. So, well, why why do the right experiment when you can just tell a story that, you know, people don't who people don't you can't correct science anymore. So why not just tell a story that markets your idea? Yeah. I mean, that's basically what it is. Could um, someone design an mRNA injection that would produce viruses? Yeah, Amy could do that tomorrow. I do. It's called tra in vitro transcription reactions that then I transfected to cells. Yeah, you can make a full-length RNA of the whole viral genome, and that would make viruses. But, of course, you'd have to modify them so they wouldn't make you sick. But, yes, you could do that for sure. Well, for mine, I want them to, be, I want them to cause sickness, right? In your case, yes. If required boosters come out, I hope you stick to your guns on that and speak out. We will. Uh, we, you know, Amy doesn't speak out except for here. This is Amy's forum, um, but I speak out elsewhere. I will. I don't think we need boosters unless, if, if the science shows we do, then I'll say that. But I haven't seen it so well, far. Well, it's kind of hard now to do that experiment. Yes, it is hard. Have you ever visited Strecker Memorial Lab on Roosevelt Island? Is that the old smallpox? Laboratory? Do you know? I don't know, Strecker. but you know who would know? Strecker Memorial. Who would know? Condit. It's 24 miles from me. Oh, yeah, it's the old. Uh, yeah, I've seen it. It okay, was why built. Don't you Condit go and do a twiff there. You could do it, your smallpox twiff there. It was, a, it was the first institution in the U.S. for pathological and bacteriological research. I've passed it on the, uh, what is it, the circle line, right? I've mm -hmm. passed it. It's all abandoned and trashed. And during the smallpox outbreaks, they used to put smallpox patients there. It was a hospital. They had a hospital. You and, you, you and Conda could do your smallpox twiv, dedicated smallpox twiv there, like in the summer. <laughs> anyway, do you, are there any latent pathogens? That, no, I, I doubt it. There hasn't been anything for years, and they're all inactivated. We're dehydrated. Uh, I prefer hybrid immunity via an activated virus vaccine plus mRNA rather than getting infected. Okay. They want to get inactivated? I don't, like the, I don't like the word hybrid. Anymore. I don't know why it's hybrid. It's just immunity. Right? Mm -hmm. Have boosters been evaluated in terms of broadening the response and or bolstering memory cell production? Well, they are in, in the process, right? That is what people are looking at. And Moderna has a preprint out saying in the very preliminary studies, they believe that the boosters do broaden the immune response, but it wasn't a large enough study. So let me get this straight. So I gave you two shots and you had a thousand antibodies at seven days later. Then you came back at three months later and you had 500 antibodies. And then I gave, and then like you came back six months later and now you have 250. And now I'm going to give you a booster and it's going to go to 12 to 1250. Mm hmm Okay. And what do those numbers mean, Amy? I don't know. I, I just made them up. It's just, a, I'm just saying that. So I gave you a shot. No, oh, we're going to look at breath. We're going to look at how many variants can be neutralized by these antibodies. Well, if it's the same, if it's the same antigen, why do I think it's not going to make it more broad? It's just going to stimulate the cells that are already there. Yes. The hope is that so it will be that like... it's not going to make it any broader. The hope is it will be like infection followed by one vaccine But it dose. can't be like infection. I understand, but, but that's the hope. Yeah, well, that's misguided. It can't... 
<laughs> well, let, let's think about this, Vincent. It can't be anywhere near the. It can't be anywhere near the breadth of infection because yeah. infection is a population of virus, and it is not a clonal population of virus. It is a population of virus that has an alteration at a gazillion sites. The M, the vaccine is clonal. I understand. So how could it possibly give you? I understand. I'm just telling this this D614 what people are thinking. Yeah, I understand, but it's misguided. I think they get it. Yeah. No, I All don't right. think that the people who come out and say that you that giving you a vaccine and then giving you a boost is going to give you the breath that natural infection is has is gets the idea of of what do you you no longer like the term quasi species what do you like swarm swarm I like of quasi bees? I like quasi species but so how can a clonal vaccine mimic a quasi species viral it doesn't. infection it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't Okay, Russ wants to know, can you elaborate more on staunch resistance to booster while staunch support for initial vaccine? Initial vaccine prevents hospitalization and death ninety in the 90th percentile. There's no evidence that that's declined, so we don't need a booster. Right, Amy? Yeah, if you're in the 90th percentile and I boost you and you become in the 90th percentile, what's the point? It's like yes. if you're transformed, I can't transform you anymore. You're transformed. <laughs> okay. Although I agree that the reasoning for the booster is wrong, is it not true that doing two shots with a little gap in between can be good to make the decision builder? Yeah. What? Amy has always said the bigger the gap, the better. And now people say, yes, six months would be good. Three weeks, four weeks is too short. And Amy sent me a paper today which says using less vaccine in the first dose is actually better than the full dose. Do you remember? Fractional vaccine. You like that paper? I did. Man, just imagine if you and I had been in charge. I don't think I don't think they're going to like me on the pandemic preparedness committee. I think they're going to say she needs to go. So today we had a discussion about people are publishing too many papers, which just cements the canonical view and doesn't allow for different views. And, and this Vernon is saying, remind me of Park Ranger telling the story of the Gettysburg Address, asking if anyone remembered who spoke before Lincoln. <laughs> it's right. Nobody knows. No one remembers. Is there a way to find out where to, someone can get monoclonals locally? It seems many people haven't heard about them. Uh, yes, Daniel is always saying how there's there's there are some directories where you can find out. Um, how can I? How can you find this out? You'd have to go back to the TWIV where he's talked about it. Because many people have asked this on TWIV, and he's answered the questions. Look through the emails and, and see the, the, when the questions, right? Microbe.tv slash TWIV, and look for the emails associated with his episodes. Is there any downside to getting the second Shingrix vaccine shot only one week after a Pfizer booster? Amy? Uh, as long as you don't have side effects and you feel fine, I would think it would be fine. Yeah. Um. So what does this mean? Amy doesn't get it that she's smart, and many of us are way out of our depth in this realm. I don't get this. Is this not, like so? So, folks, she, this, Amy, this doesn't but, sound very nice. I don't get this. Amy's criticizing the people in charge, not you, on this live stream, when she's being critical. So don't pick on her. All right. Anyway, Shingrix, you can get if if you're okay, if you're feeling good. Priscilla, Aortico found culturable COVID two virus in twenty percent of kids coming in for tonsil removal. I know he also found other viruses. And last time I talked to him years ago, he had found other viruses in kids who had come in for tonsil removals. I forgot Is which he ones. The guy who's friendly with Spinny with Spin with Kathy. Yeah, and so his student. He, like, uh, got 
that there was rhinovirus in the tonsils too, right? That's Wasn't right. That what That's Kalita, right. Like thinks. Yeah, but they didn't publish that, right? Not that I'm aware yeah. of. Yeah, that was Rhino. He was getting out of the tonsils, right? Okay, so AY4.2 is Delta Plus. Hooray. Delta it's, Plus? It's ridiculous. Oh, it got extra credit? It's ridiculous. Well, probably the press are calling it Delta Plus. But we're sequencing too much, and we have all these changes. We don't know what to make of them. We don't need to sequence. I mean, I've, I've already vocalized this numerous times. What's the point? What are you trying to do? Are you trying to control an outbreak or are you trying to scientifically study viral evolution? They're two separate activities. Right. I would argue evolution is a, is a good objective. Yes, but right? then you don't, yes, but then you don't do it in this fashion. I agree. And then how are you going to test that any of these helped? Like in theory, it's, you know, you came out of some animal or whatever, and now you're adapting to a new host, right? And these changes are helping you adapt to the new host in some some fashion or, or rather, or something rather. And so how are you going to ever figure that out considering the fact you can't test directly on humans? So are you going to test like on white-tailed deer? And then say the mutations that, the alterations that allow it to be high, you know, more efficiently, more fit in white-tailed deer, but but then lose virulence. Are you then going to say, well, that's what happens in people? No, you can't do that, obviously. What are your thoughts on an immunocompromised individual with three doses of Pfizer going to an indoor concert? Wear a mask. You think they can go? Yeah, but wear a mask. You can't because I don't know what I don't know what an immunocompromised individual is. Is it a T cell defect? Is it a complement defect? Is it a B cell defect? Is yeah. it an interferonopathy? What is it? Could make a lot of difference. UK has a surge because the opening up without full vaccination and now school mitigation. They need a variant to blame. Yeah, exactly right. All right, Russ says he saw a video from Campbell today. His words were basically, investigate the spike, otherwise no need to panic. Really, this from a man who got people to panic many times before. Hmm. Okay, well, it's 847, and I have to set up my Eliza, so we'll do three more, and then I have to set up my Eliza. And luckily, my virus doesn't misbehave. How vast were the Pfizer boost of clinical trials? Is the safety data comparable to the first two jabs? Much less vast. I don't have the numbers at hand. Not, you know, the, the, the trials, the sec phase three was 45,000 people. So this wasn't anywhere close to that. But um, I don't see why there would be a safety issue. The smaller trial is statistically supported. You you design it so that it gives you the answers, and you and and you decide whether that's enough. Um, how do you, how does mRNA create antibodies to fight cancer, Amy? Well, the mRNA encodes that what you think is the quote unquote cancer antigen and you generate antibodies and hopefully that antigen is on the surface of the cancer cell so then you can discriminate the cancer cell from normal cells and you only attack the cancer cell but mm -hmm. uh tumors are very heterologous and just because you have what you know you have a prostate cancer and i have a prostate cancer um they're not always they're not necessarily the same at all so it will be hard to do and if your target and then it depends on like treatment for blood cancers is totally different than treatment for solid tumor cancers totally like they're they're like apples and pineapples or apples and potatoes. They're totally different. Apples and pineapples are totally different too. 
Yeah, but a potato is like an underground fruit, right? It's an underground <laughs> vegetable. An apple grows on a tree, and so does so does a pineapple, right? They're pineapple trees, right? Third trimester, pregnant women. What's the advisory? Should get vaccinated. Get vaccinated. Yeah, second, third trimester is the best time because the antibodies. I mean, second is better because you have more time for the antibodies in the mother to transfer to the fetus. Third, less time, but you should still do it to protect her. Yeah. I just sent you two papers, you and Daniel, two papers about vaccine, about pregnancy and vaccination and stuff. Okay. All right. With this, you want to get your last one. Why does the Pfizer make your arm sore, stiff neck, lower back? Why does it do that? Anytime you stick a metal sta a spear into your arm, it's going to be sore. <laughs> Even if it's a fishing lure, <laughs> it's going to be sore. That's just the way it works. But the the <laughs> systemic... True. It's true. Well, that's part of it. But the systemic <laughs> symptoms, your, your stiff neck, lower back, cytokines, your body... Has an inflammatory yeah, but you get reaction. The same cytokines, and I'm sure that you could be sore all over after you stick your uh, stick no, a no, 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 no. your arm. No, look, sticking something in your arm also makes inflammation, and the cytokines can spread elsewhere. So yeah, that's could what be I'm part saying. of it. But I also think there's a, an inflammatory response to the antigen, and that's well, there could be. But that's what's I'm going just around. That the majority of time, oh, apparently, pineapples do not grow on trees; they grow low to the ground. I don't know. Yeah. I've never been to a pineapple field farm. Bromeliads. Amy, any validity to the concern that molnupiravir can be oncogenic? <laughs> Just like oh. ripovirin is? I want to hear your answer. I haven't talked to you about this, have I? Um, so actually, Daniel sent us the paper, the JID paper with, with that. Barrick and I think Sheehan was the last author and they claim it's going to be oncogen or they state they believe that it's going to cause oncogenesis based off of Cho cell data. And it's not really so. clear that it's really truly an AIMS test. It's not clear to me that you can extrapolate the AIMS test results into you know, even from AIMS test into what happens in respiratory cells. And it's, you know, we've been using ribavirin for, it's basically, a, you know, a version of ribavirin. It works the same way. So we've been using ribavirin for years against flu and hepatitis C, and we don't see an enhanced cancer problem in those patients. Why would I assume that it's going to be an enhanced cancer problem here. And how much do you need to to ingest for it to be a cancer problem? Like, you know what? Potato chips can can cause cancer if you eat, you know, 15 bags every day for the next 30 years of your life. Okay. I don't think, what do you think? I think that the studies that Merck did, which we don't see, show that it's not oncogenic because it wouldn't have gone into phase one if it were but let's see when they when they get the authorization we'll see what the studies are because they'll have to publish them well the other thing is is we don't really have an rna we don't have an rna dependent rna polymerase right i guess the metabolite i guess through its well, it changes it to a dna yeah it goes into the ribonucleotide pool all yes. of that precursor pool and then it gets converted yeah so right, I guess nucleotide reductase converts it to dntp yeah. so it can get incorporated into dna it's no problem uh this one is for you by the way right uh, one more. this is a lot of victor I have to go. six months ago i visited markets with grilled bat hiked in caves face planted in back guano swam in guano cave water and ate wild grilled civet cat all in one day hi amy <laughs> I thought you'd that's like that. Day. That is, I do like that, but that's quite the day. So let's get this. Let's get what he did. He had a grilled bat for breakfast. Then he went on a hike. Then he tripped on his hike and face planted in, in some guano. Then to wash off the guano, he swam in more guano-containing water. 
And then for dinner, so, he went to some restaurant and they served him Civic Cat. Yeah. Here, okay. but he says, it was delicious. Potential for zoonotic jump definitely exists. Hundreds of cave complexes are everywhere in northern Laos and still being discovered. That's the point. Yeah, I know what the point was. I just, it was being funny. Um, everything apparently is, although he didn't say it's like chicken. He said it's like duck. I guess everything isn't like chicken. So that was the, did you, were you on that twiv with the Lao sampling? Of course. I picked so he says it's pronounced Lao, not the S is silent. I'm sorry, Victor. My apologies. Lao. I'm I sure. hope I can remember that. But yes, whole, that's the one that Dixon had, had, had technical difficulties. We started out without him. And then he talked about he and Marlene went to this cave in the waters that had yeah. a big Buddha and all the and I and he said all these people flocked to these caves and I asked him if it was like going for Mecca, you know, when they make the pilgrimage to Mecca and all this other stuff. But yeah, for sure, because the whole point was I had always I had always said that you needed to go south, right? Yep. Um can you answer this? Is PC test currently used for COVID sensitive to other viral infections? PC. I, I guess it means the PCR I, test. Okay. No. If it's the, well, wait, it depends on what, where you are. So if you go for a specific COVID test, like you go, like we used to do, those are only for COVID. If you go to the hospital and you have some kind of respiratory disease, and you, they send it to a biofire, yes, it's tested for 37 other respiratory pathogens or whatever the number is. It's part of the respiratory pathogen panel now of a biofire. Okay. So it depends on how you get tested. Did that make sense? Mm-hmm. All right. I got to go set up my Eliza. Bye. Thank you, Amy. I'll talk to you bye. tomorrow. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Well, no, we don't want that. <laughs> All right. You want me to tilt the camera down? Why? It's fine. And then my camera, yeah, I could tilt it, but I'm not going to futz with it with uh, in the middle of a live stream. Is there a relationship between antigenicity of viruses and long-term effects of infection? No, no, there is no relationship. You know, the long-term effects depend on what tissues are targeted and the immune response, and so forth. Why are the correlates of protection hard to determine? So what you want to know is what level of antibody is someone protected against, and then you have to define what you're protected against. Is it just infection? Is it all symptomatic disease? Is it just mild disease? Is it severe disease and death? You have to decide what you want. So how do you do that? Well, let's say you have a millions of people who are vaccinated and you do serological assays and you measure all their antibodies and then you say this one with this low antibody got mild uh, severe disease you know so you could do correlations but then that ignores the t-cell arm because they typically protect you against severe disease and death so in the one paper where they tried to calculate a correlate of protection they looked at all the, they sort of did what i just said they took all these the antibody tests from the vaccine trials the phase one two and three trials and they co compared them against how well those vaccines protected against covid mild and severe and then they determined the the, the percentage of antibodies in convalescence here that correlated with that so they, they thought in their calculations that at the correlative protection is 20% of the level of antibodies in convalescent serum. That means that you're going to be protected from mild COVID. But protection from severe COVID, only 3% of the level of antibodies in convalescent serum was needed. 3%, which tells me antibodies are not doing anything. It's T cells, which they're not measuring. So that's in part why it's hard because it's a correlation. It's not an actual experiment where you can get different levels of antibodies and then see see if they're resistant to infection or disease. And we don't look at T cells because that's really hard to do. All 
All right, I, I don't care about a CNN article. That's, CNN doesn't know what it's talking about for the most part. 3% what? Uh, all COVID? Mild COVID, moderate, severe, hospitalization? I don't want to know just COVID. I don't want to know 3%. That's not of any use to us. Because the current vaccines are 90-ish percent effective at preventing severe COVID and death. But they're not 90-ish percent effective at preventing mild COVID. It's a big difference. So telling me 3% is useless. And anyway, I want to see the data. I don't want a CNN article. If you have the original data, which you don't, there's no paper yet. And they're probably misinterpreting it. Uh, have variants slowed down? I haven't heard of any new. No, there are plenty of new variants. They're just not variants of concern, right? Part of the issue is that in many places where vaccination is going well, the infections are going down like the U.S. So less infections, less variants. But they are still, um, they're still rising because we're sequencing. The Tuller angle was awkward. Yes, I understand. He came in. I didn't have any time to set up and he needed to go. This is the problem with not having someone to help me set up ahead of time. But it's still the words are what matter, right? Delta Plus, I would say, we don't know what's going to go on with it. Just we'll have to wait and see. People will be doing some lab tests. Can I ask the Daniel how the 13-year-old with COVID and Downs is doing? Okay. Um, I will, I'll try and remember. What are the options for amplifying an unknown sample when you may not have the right primers? You use um, random hexamers to amplify the DNA, then you sequence it. Do vaccinated people shed stuff? <laughs> vaccinated people appear to shed a small amount of virus for a very short time after infection and you know nobody's looked for infectious virus so it's not even clear so i i we we talked about this earlier i don't think you need to quarantine for 10 days um, if they're worried you could wear a mask or they could wear a mask but i think the evidence for shedding is very very low i'm concerned at 72 running low on unassigned t-cells well, that's a good point, Don, because as you know, as you get older, it's harder and harder for you to make new T cells. Yes. Um, I, as I said, I don't think you need a booster. But don't listen to me. Make your own judgment because I'm not a doctor. I'm just going on the science. Um, I, I think if you really are worried about it, Get your booster and don't worry about the T cells because one more is not going to hurt. But I, I don't think you need it. It's a good question, though. No one ever has asked that they're concerned about running low on T cells. You know, as you age, your bone marrow gets smaller and smaller, and you have uh, kind of empty bones. The long bones get empty. Yeah. Is there any correlation between when a COVID test could first show you're positive and when you could first infect other people? When your first test, so now when it's first positive, you still may have very low amounts of virus and not enough to infect other people. So no, for example, if you are randomly testing, not based on symptoms, because if you feel symptoms of a cold and you get tested, you're most likely at the peak of shedding. And yes, you are infectious, but... If you're earlier and you're getting tested randomly, as many companies and universities do, then you could be at a very early point in infection and not be transmitting. Now, of course, if, you're, if you have an asymptomatic infection, which means you are never getting symptoms, then all bets are off because you don't know where you are when you get that positive. And that's where the CT value, the cycle threshold value, is useful because 
if there's a lot of viral RNA, the cycle threshold value will be low, and that's compatible with transmission, shedding and transmission. Yeah. We need to be on Bill Maher, Maher, Maher. Why should we be on? I've never watched Bill Maher or Maher. I'm sorry. I don't watch much TV. And I don't like watching the news. It's, it's absurd. Even if it's science, it's horrible because they get it wrong. And if it's politics, it's horrible because it's horrible. <laughs> so I don't watch TV. Where do I get my news from? I read Heather Cox Richardson's email every day. And I read the journals, the science journals, and I talk to Amy. A few months ago, you mentioned it would take 18 months to know where they're boosters. I think it'll take a while, yes, to know if they're necessary to see. Here's the key. If that 90 percentile protection against severe disease and death starts to decline, then, yes, you need a booster. But it's not declining. Is the current lab UK spike a result of lab screw up? I don't know. I'm not sure 43,000 people would make a big difference, especially if they're scattered. I don't know. I haven't read that. What are the salespeople at B&H like? Well, it depends who you get. <laughs> so when I go, I buy what I need online in my office and then they they send me an email when it can be picked up i go get it and then i wait in line and the people at the checkout where you go and pick it up they have been all very nice actually uh, i haven't had any problem with them but in years past i have gone browsing and and yeah some people can be abrupt but it's like any other place right uh maybe not you know an, a fancy department store that mostly are nice yeah, but now and then you get. So I would say in general, they're fine. They're helpful. They're very busy. Microbe TV is taking up all my free time. If you do get a booster, what would be the optimum interval? I would say six months. <laughs> Here's a cool one. What's different about the immune system from ages 0 to 10 compared to adults? Are the immune systems like Windows 3.1 versus an adult Windows 10? Uh, I, I don't know the difference between Windows 3.1 and, and 10, but I presume it's, you know, better developed and can do more things. Well, I guess that's what the immune system is. So between when you're born, you have no immune system. You get antibodies from your mother to hold you over until three to six months your immune system starts to develop. But it's not really that good yet. It takes time, so I would say it's uneducated for your first decade of life. But then beyond that, it's seen a lot of infections. It has gotten practice. Things have been honed. And then as an adult, you make good responses. Now, that's got pluses and minuses. So many viral diseases are mainly immunopathological. That means most of the signs and symptoms are caused by the immune response. So kids can often have less immunopathology than certain viral infections. Certain, not all. And then when you have a robust immune response in your adult years, you can have more immunopathology. But then again, you can better clear some infections. And then as you get old, your immune system degrades. I don't know what the computer equivalent of that would be, right, as you age. Uh, you know, my iPhone doesn't hold the charge anymore. Maybe <laughs> that's a good analogy. I don't know. So it goes down again, yeah. My mom, 81-year-old year tough from southern Italy. Yeah, my father, my family's from southern Italy. Two Pfizer doses, started chemo last month. Oncologist recommends a COVID booster. She wanted and received Pfizer, but Moderna was offered. Well, it's, it's fine. I think uh, on chemo, it, it may make sense. They're not going to test everyone for antibodies and T-cells, so you might as well just take it, yeah. What part of Italy? Which province? My father was from Basilicata. Round two for J&J. &J. So here, I think the J&J &J story merits a second dose. Yeah, because the numbers look good. They go up into the 90s. The uh, 
efficacy, no, effectiveness goes up into the 90s with a booster of J&J. Because remember, that's a one and done. It's not really a one and done. The, the levels are too low to begin with. Yeah, so a booster is good for that. Uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria will revert to non resistant if all antibiotic use is stopped. Will antiviral, re well, not always, depends on the antibiotic, but anyway, will antiviral resistant virus strains revert if antiviral selection pressure stops? Not always. It depends on the, uh, the particular antiviral and the resistance. And that's why, you know, re a, a drug resistant HIV circulate because they arise in one person and then they leave and go to another who doesn't have the drug yet and they can still reproduce and then that person gets the drug and they're resistant. When are we going to eradicate polio virus and will you celebrate? Um, I would say so. The, the last countries where there is wild polio. Mm -hmm. Whereas Afghanistan, Pakistan. The only reason we have polio there, and it's less than a, it's a few hundred cases, no more than that a year, is because we can't get in to immunize. So that's because terrorists prevent the vaccinologists from getting in. So I think if we can get in, we could eradicate it in five years. Will I celebrate? I will talk about it on my podcasts and probably blog about it. Um, I, I think it's a good thing to eradicate another viral disease, yeah. So I, you could say that I would celebrate, although I'm, I'm not going to go out to dinner. I'm not going to, you know, have a glass of wine. <laughs> I would just talk about it here and elsewhere. I guess that would be my way of celebrating it, right? So Colopy is the person whose teacher wants them to be a ribosome. Do all coronas bind to ACE2 or just SARS-CoV-2? Not all. A couple of them do. SARS-1 bound to uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, ACE2 and uh, one or two of the common cold coronas do, but other coronaviruses do not bind ACE2. Is that why it has vascular effects? Not, probably not. I think that there are most likely other reasons. The receptor is not the only story, and we don't know the answer, actually. Do we need to do regular disinfection? Uh, I don't think that hygiene theater is needed any longer. I think the only thing that I do and which is useful is to wash your hands because you may pick up virus in the public and just on the chance that you might introduce it to your nose or eyes, I wash my hands when I get home and that's it, nothing else. Thank you for your contribution. Amy is only right, yeah, always right. Now, children's immune systems are not stronger. They're in the process of being trained, right? So at some point, they get better, but not children, no. Can adults have RSV and be asymptomatic? Yes, for sure. Uh, but although uh, the older you get, the more likely it's to be symptomatic. But yes, many adults have asymptomatic infections because they have a lot of antibodies from many, many infections, yeah. So uh, Amy's gone, but I don't know what she would say about a second J&J. &J. That's the only one I agree with because I think one was not enough. Yep. You want to know more about this germline immunity for SARS-CoV-2? Uh, that is a paper. Well, we're going to, we might talk about it on Twitter Friday, but essentially they take uh, B cells from people who never were infected with SARS-CoV-2 and they can isolate antibodies that, neutralize SARS-CoV-2 as well as other viruses. So some form of antibodies are encoded in the germline, and they weren't there because of SARS-CoV-2 because people weren't infected with SARS-CoV-2 before 2019. So they're there for other reasons, and that what that is we don't know. But there are germline antibodies for a number of viruses, including respiratory syncytial virus. There are germline antibodies. We've always thought that. That's because that virus has been insulting humans for many years. But SARS-CoV-2 is not, so there's some other reason, unless related viruses can do that. But I don't think that's the case. Can you e explain if SARS-1 is still circulating and whether our vaccines will protect us? So it is no longer circulating. It was, it was extinguished after 8,000 cases 
uh, because it didn't transmit very well. And would current vaccines protect us? Uh, it depends. Um, so if you had COVID and recovered and then get one boost of vaccine, your antibodies will neutralize SARS-CoV-1 if it were around, but it's not. Okay? That's the super immunity that recovered vaccinated people have. You, you're protected against SARS-1. You're protected against MERS, common cold coronas. It's really remarkable uh, that you're protected against so many um, coronaviruses. Uh, what is a serotype? Oh, Amy should be here because she has a different definition of serotype than I do. But historically, a serotype is a virus that's antigenically different from another enough so that antibodies will not neutralize it. She'll, she will say, I'm totally wrong, but this is how I was trained. So polio virus, three serotypes. You get infected with polio one, you make antibodies against it. So now next year, you get infected with polio two, you make a memory response to polio one. Those antibodies do not protect you against polio two because polio two is a different serotype. So it's antigenically distinct. So you say if a virus elicits 20 different antibodies, yeah, for 20 epitopes, does it become a new serotype only when all of the original 20 no longer bind? I don't think you need all. It depends on the dominance of each epitope, right? It, epitopes have different immunological dominance, which means when that virus gets into a person, you get a big antibody response against some epitopes and less so against others. So there could be a few immunodominant epitopes, and if you change them, that might be enough to make a new serotype. Okay. All right, what's the title of the paper? Now I'm going to pull it up, okay, since you asked. Um, what, what is this uh, messages? Um, I will tell you here in a moment. Hang on, she, she sent it... Um, Here we go. I'm going to share this with you. It's a science article. Um, let me share my, my desktop. There you go. So, naive human B cells engage the receptor binding domain. Uh, it's too big. Sorry. Let me, let me make it smaller. Here we go. Of uh, SARS-CoV-2 variants of concern and related sorbecoviruses. Sorbe so that's the title of the paper. Science immunology, uh, you can just search the title, okay? That's pretty cool. What's an ACE2 triple decoy? <laughs> um, I don't know what a triple decoy is, but essentially what they likely tried is to make ACE2 protein and then see if you could prevent infection by giving people that. The same thing was done with CD4, the receptor for HIV. It doesn't work. Uh, and we should have learned from that experience, but not. And why has it failed? Because it, you cannot block um, infection sufficiently with that. Uh, it's not good enough to inhibit attachment. Can I comment on Sweden's response? I can't because I don't actually know exactly what they did. Whenever we on TWIV say something, someone writes and says, no, you're wrong about that. So I, you know, I don't know exactly what they did. Now, if you assume that they let the virus rip, then I think that's, that's wrong because too many people died and a lot of people died. But then people will say, oh, well, not that many people died, but I don't see why any people dying is a good thing or excusable in any way so I can't I, I will admit to not knowing exactly what they did but on the surface it doesn't look like it was a good approach and so again the Delta variant it's a, there are many Delta offshoots and you know as soon as they start to go up in one place people get scared but in the UK they have a, a rise in cases because not enough people are vaccinated, et cetera, and people are getting together, and they blame the variant. So that's always what is happening. Okay, now we're talking about... Oh, here, this is very nice. 
Uh, I was extremely hesitant but got vaccinated because of you. Not much side effects. Is my immune system broken? No, no, not at all. Some people have a lot of side effects. Some have none. Some have in between. There's no relationship to your the effectiveness of your immune response at all. So I'm glad you did that. That's great. I made a difference in one person. Very good. Probably um, um, more people too. All right. My sister recovered from uh, COVID a few weeks ago, was fully vaxxed. She feels constant confusion, forgetful, depressed, any neurological issues post-COVID. So, of course, there's long COVID, but whether it happens after these so-called infections after vaccination is not known. So your sister might be one of those, but we're waiting for the studies to look at that. Daniel has said we're waiting for that. So, you know, your, your sister is an anecdotal case. We need more to really make a um, decision. Yes, mild, moderate, and severe are typical medical terms, but sometimes they're used improperly and you have to define them always, right? And in terms of COVID, what does mild mean? What numbers are you talking about? Okay, can't be a subjective thing. <laughs> Severe means a huge hospital bill. Well, you go in the hospital, yes, and you may need ICU, you may need ventilation. And then, of course, death would be the next one. Would the 50 microgram offer the same increase in antibodies as the 100? Well, there is a paper that Amy sent me here. It's not the same as um, what you're talking about. It's with respect to uh, adenovirus vaccine. So uh, fractionating a COVID-19 advive vector vaccine improves virus-specific immunity. So they gave less vaccine and here, this finding show an unexpected advantage of fractionating. I, I should put the, uh, qu the cursor here. These findings show an unexpected advantage of fractionating vaccine doses. Prime, the first dose, warranting a reevaluation of vaccine trial protocols. So it's a thing. Using less vaccine virus might be better. Thank you, Faster Tortoise. You know, you left a while ago. I saw this, but thank you for your support. Really appreciate it. Okay, so natural immunity is as robust or more robust than the jab. Why can't we just prove we've had the bug and be good to go? Jumping through these hoops, ignoring facts, fuels anti-vax sentiment. So I, I agree that if you've been infected, but... Yes, I agree that if you have been infected, you should be considered vaccinated. I agree. Does your university or lab, my lab receives no funding from the pharmaceutical industry. And uh, so I give advice. I don't give advice. I tell you what the science is on the vaccines. You have to make your own decision in the end. I am beholden to no one. Nobody gives me money except you guys. Here, you, you support us here and you support on Patreon and PayPal just so that I can do this. Doesn't influence my statements about vaccines. Uh, the rest of the universe, it uh, doesn't matter if the rest of the university does. The university gives me barely any money. I raise, Amy raises the money on grants. So I think I'm pretty neutral and not biased by the farm industry. And if you look at my history, I'm not shy about criticizing farm. I've done it many times when they deserve it. Believe me. j, &J protection against infection. Who cares? What about severe disease and death? It's not 3%. 3% against infection doesn't matter. That's the way all vaccines work, folks. You get vaccinated, your antibodies level declines in six months, you're going to get infected, and then your memory response kicks in in two or three days. But in that two or three day window, you're going to get infected. And if you get a PCR test in that period or thereafter, you're going to be infected. It's an irrelevant number. Do you understand? It's an irrelevant number. And why was it 90% protection in the beginning? Because your antibody levels were so high. 
it's normal for the antibodies to go down. What's important is protection against severe and fatal disease, and that's not 3%. Did I get my flu shot? I didn't get it yet. I, sh I need to get it. I have to go to the medical center. I'm not there all, every day now. Breakthrough SARS-CoV-2 in, in vaccinated veterans, 600,000. What's the denominator? I need to know that. Is it, is it 6 million? In which case, I'm not surprised. Breakthrough infections, but not severe. They're not going to die, most likely. Uh, we're going through a new wave in the UK with an increase in hospital. Why are vaccines so bad at stopping transmission? Why do you say they're bad at stopping transmission? How do you know those cases have come from vaccinated people? You have no idea. They probably came from unvaccinated people because if they're 20% of unvaccinated people, that's still many, many millions of people who can transmit. Yes, thank you. I'm not a puppet of big pharma. Uh, is the pandemic still over for the vaccinated? I don't think so. The pandemic is more than just being infected, right? It's about disruption of your economic and social lives, political lives, and all that. Travel, right? It's it's not over. No, things are not normal. Guys, do you think Fauci could have access to some study that has not been published? No, he has no access to any study that's not published. He's just erring on the safe side. That's it. He's a public health official. But as Amy would say, the messaging has not been good. So it's changed. It's inconsistent. And that's not good. Do you think the most recent drop in U.S. COVID cases has been due to Delta running its course and enough of him? I think the drop is due to increases in vaccinations, which went up, right, when we had the big spike, when the mandated vaccinations, you know, we went up to a million a day for a while. And I think also you exhaust the number of susceptibles. It happens with every outbreak. And they're still susceptible people, but the virus has not found them. And if they're not vaccinated, they will get infected at another time. So that's what I think is going on. I'm 71 and didn't think I needed Pfizer booster, but if I ended up about to be intubated, I'd be saying maybe I should have had the booster. So I got the booster. Fine. No problem, Peter. I get it. Yeah, you could never know if... if but remember, um, the, the, if the vaccines protect you, say, 95% against severe disease and death, that's still 5% are going to get severe disease and die. That's still pretty good. It's better than most vaccines, but it's not 100%. So some people will die, and you don't know if the vaccine is going to take care of that. You're not going to go up to 100% with a booster. I meant the booster there, so... But it's fine. I understand your logic. I'm not getting a booster because I don't see the need for it, the scientific need. Fauci was talking about boosters and his TWIV. I think he just likes boosters. You know, he made this statement a few weeks ago. He said, oh, many vaccines need three doses. So what? What, is, what does that have to do with anything? There are many vaccines that don't have three. So that's just ridiculous. Sorry. Why people with antibodies but without antigen valid tests don't get a certificate? Well, I, you do need to have antibodies, right? So you have to test for them and show you have them. And antigen is not enough, I guess. Yeah. Is there any evidence that vaccinated individuals are boosted by natural infection? So it's another study that's in the in the works. Daniel always talks about that. Um, we'll see. We don't know yet. You're not for boosters. Can they do more damage than good? I don't think the third booster can do damage. Let me under, let me explain what I'm talking about. Turbo. I don't see the science supporting the need for a booster. That's what I'm about. But you can all get boosters if you want. But I don't think we need them. 
Is there harm? I doubt it. So get them if you would like a booster, if you're offered it. But I go by the science. I'm data-driven. And that's what you're here to listen to. They're answering questions that aren't in the chat log. Yeah, well, I'm only answering questions that are in the chat log. <laughs> that's, I have a list of them here. I click on them. They show up in the video, and I answer them. And Amy was doing the same. I don't know what you're talking about. No, I'm not getting a booster. 84-year-old, if you feel worried, get a booster. It's not going to hurt. Is it not the case that Delta replicates quickly enough that it does damage uh, before B cells can fully react? It's a possibility, yes. This has been suggested, and I mentioned it um, on TWIV. And that is what Sarah Gilbert said on her TWIV. Sarah Gilbert, the developer of the Chadox vaccine. I hope you listened to her TWIV. It was really good. Um, yeah, it's a possibility. But I feel that the, the data doesn't support that. Nobody looks at infectious virus. So how could you conclude this? You're all going by PCR. But it's a reasonable explanation for why um, Delta might cause more infections in vaccinated people because you have that initial period when the B cells haven't responded, the memory B cells. So I, I think that's completely logical explanation. Are they going to make us wear masks for the flu now? No. I don't know who you think they is. <laughs> but um, no, they won't make you wear masks for flu. This is a pandemic. However, if there's a flu pandemic, they might. But they didn't in the last few. What would Rosalind Franklin say about... I don't know what she would say, frankly. I don't know. They should toggle the timestamp. I... I can't in my uh, streaming software. Sorry. All right. So you want me to translate. I, I try sometimes, but I can't do it all the time. Can't do it all the time. Do ribosomes within a per particular cell last a long time? Or do they get replaced frequently? They do turn over. They, they don't last forever. Uh, I don't know what the half-life is. What a good question. You want to look it up? Half-life of ribosome. <laughs> what would we do without the internet? Half-life is 107 hours. Take that. What makes long COVID brain fog? It is probably a combination of hypoxia, lack of oxygen, and cytokines going into the brain and causing damage. Does COVID increase the chances of developing diabetes? I don't know. It's a good question. Let's see. I have not seen that in all the, the literature I've looked at. I mean, certainly having diabetes is a comorbidity right uh, and a lot of patients uh, with who end up getting admitted to hospital have diabetes but I'm not sure about it increasing it why not J&J &J after mRNA sure I see no problem in mixing and matching absolutely against which epitope are monoclonal antibodies targeted all over the spike so the ones that work to prevent infection, those are directed mainly against the part of the spike that binds the receptor ACE2 and then what's called the N-terminal domain, which is right next to it. So there are many monoclonal antibodies recognizing different epitopes. Can ionized air destroy airborne coronavirus? I don't believe so. I think uh, if you put U far UVC in the air at night when everyone's gone, that will destroy the virus, but not ionized air, no. Ralph Barrick said this is just a viral pneumonia, but with acute lung injury. In the, in the respiratory tract, 
it seems to be. But this has other consequences, right? And he didn't know that at the time because we hadn't found out. So it's it's more broad than we originally realized. Would you say they're not helpful? There's no evidence that boosters are helpful. Right? There's no evidence yet that boosters... So what is a booster going to do? It may prevent infection, actually, right? Because your antibody levels will be high. But then they're going to go down in six to eight months. And so you're going to get infected. And then what if the pre prevention of severe disease and death is still 90-some percent? Of the boosters have done nothing. So are they going to tell us to get another round of boosters every year to kick those antibody levels up? I don't think that's a good public health strategy. Do you understand what I'm saying? We have uh, 575 people here. That's great. Can you please give me a thumbs up and get us over uh, 300? That would be nice. Not for just so that maybe other people will find this. That's all. Uh, why does the immune system attack mRNA vaccine induced spike? Well, it doesn't attack it, it probes it. It says, What is this? It says, Oh, it's foreign. Let's make antibodies and T cells against it and keeps those ready for if you get infected. And so it's a foreign protein. Body does not have spike. So if you make it, the immune system will recognize it. If traveling to a spot with a low vaccination rate, would you recommend getting the booster? I don't see why you would. You would still have a very good protection against severe disease and death from the um, vaccines now. Without a booster, you may get infected. You may get a common cold. And if you don't even want that, a booster will give you high antibody levels. And as long as you go to Egypt within six months, you won't get infected. So if you want to do that, then yes, get a booster. Is there any evidence that getting the virus after getting vaccinated will boost immunity? There is some, for sure. Uh, but is it like the immunity you get when you're infected and then vaccinated is not clear. We don't know the answer to that yet. What is your retort to this assertion that the vaccine-induced spike is a cytotoxin? Yeah, it is. It will, it will cause cells to fuse, but not the vaccine spike because it's modified in the, to prevent fusion. So the wild type 1 is certainly a toxin because it causes cells to fuse, but not the vaccine one. So that's a little bit of a misunderstanding there. Do a smallpox twib. I have, we have one in the, in the plans. Uh, Rich Condit is getting a smallpox, is trying to get a smallpox or a pox virus person from, from Brazil, and we'll do that. Yeah. Hasn't been found that both infected, vaccinated, and unvaccinated people carry similar viral loads. Therefore, isolation should be the same. So, what do you mean by viral load? PCR? Uh, well, first of all, PCR is not the same as infectious virus. So, we don't know if they have similar amounts of infectious virus. But the study you're citing by the CDC just took samples from people at one time point. A similar study done in Singapore took daily samples from people over 10 days. And at day one, the vaccinated and unvaccinated people had similar PCR levels. Day two, the PCR levels in the vaccinated people plummeted and the unvaccinated people kept high. So the insinuation is that, yeah, you get infected, you have a little virus in you, maybe equivalent to unvaccinated people, but then your memory response kicks in and bang, it goes way down. So I don't think that's a problem. And also remember, this is in a small fraction of vaccinated people. The fraction of vac unvaccinated people who get infected is far higher. In the absence of vaccines, wouldn't slowing the spread measures possibly increase variant formation and possibly death. 
Shouldn't we? Pu- All right. So the last part I get. Yes, we should be putting more effort into vaccinating other countries. Because, yes, if most of the world is vaccinated, then the variant emergence is much less. Yes. If one is willing to read preprints and published papers, what journals or search techniques do you and Amy use? Please use the example of how contagious vaccinated or unvaccinated people are. Okay, so the problem is, uh, Randy, that it takes time for a paper to go through peer review. That is, to have it looked at by... Scientists who say, oh, this this experiment is wrong, you have to do something else or fix the statistics, right? It takes a long time. So what we have right now for this question, vaccinated versus unvaccinated, are, are a few. Well, we have a CDC report, which is not peer-reviewed at all and has flaws. And then we have a preprint from Singapore neither of which has gone through peer review, which would fix any flaws. So you can go to BioArchive or MedArchive, and they have a, a button there that you can click on and see all the coronavirus papers that have been posted that day. And the problem is they could be wrong. And that's what we look at, but I try not to talk about them on my podcast. I'd like to wait for the journal article, which means it's gotten scrutiny, and that that will take months and months and months. And by that time, you know, we've passed this. So that's what we do. Now, we can look at the preprints and try and say, oh, yeah, there's this problem with them, but not everyone can do that. So we, we do daily scans. I have a RSS feed that I use to look at the published journals. Uh, BioArchive will, will give you that as well. But every day I'm looking at papers that are coming out. Do you know anything about progress on frame shift inhibitors? No. You know, as as you know, the um, coronaviruses do frame shifting, which is if there's a stop code on the ribosome can back up and change frames and then continue translating. It's very cool. I'm not aware of any inhibitors uh, that have gotten very far. Nope. Again, vaccinated people, very, very poor evidence that they can spread. Oh, Rosalind Franklin worked on face masks before she took those famous pictures of DNA. Thank you. Okay, you may call it a swarm, but I'm calling it a quasi-species because that was the first name given to it. You could call it a mutant swarm. You can call it a cloud. I know quasi-species isn't great, but I like it. And I wrote the book. It's, is it possible boosters are being offered because the originally suggested three to four week period between the first and second shots is too short? I've not heard that being used as an excuse. And it's a logical reason, but you have to show that it makes a difference in the immune response, right? Um, and that's what I want. I want evidence that a booster will make a better immune response, a better, broader antibody response, a longer lasting memory. And we just don't have that. As I said, we have 90th percentile protection against death and serious disease. And I think that's what the vaccines were designed to do. My antibodies at seven were high. They did not decrease. And it's important to remember that antibodies can increase Yeah, so what's your point? Did you get infected? Did you get an antibody test for N to see? Some people have antibodies persisting at higher levels. It's all an average in biology. There's no black and white, right? I don't understand what you're saying. Antibodies will eventually decline. There is no exception. It takes six months or seven or eight months or a year. They're going to decline and you're going to get infected. Here we go. Here's the Amy comment. She's very smart. Many of us are way out of our depth. Uh, I don't think it's an insult, actually. I think it's a compliment. Um, But I think between the two of us, we try and explain things. Are there any viruses for which three vaccinations have been developed and then used? There have been many with two so the polio vaccine, famously, right? There are two different vaccines 
uh, both being used currently. You know, there have been various measles vaccines, different sorts, but not used at the same time. Mm, let's see. I don't do you by different vaccines, do you mean like different kinds? So in flu vaccines, there are a bunch of different kinds. There's a egg grown and activated. There's a cell grown and activated. There's the attenuated, which is infectious. There is um, insect cell produced. So that's at least four different vaccines all being used at once. Yeah. So yeah, there are. Can we reproduce somatic hypermutation in vitro to develop future monoclonals for different viruses? Oh, that's a great a question. Uh, as, the, as the evening progresses, we get more and more interesting questions. Um, I don't know that it's been reproduced in vitro, but you can certainly mutate antibody genes in all ways, right? You could mutate every codon to give you all different combinations of amino acids and then see, and you don't have to do the whole antibody, you just need to do the combining site. So you can do that and look for, and, and people are certainly doing that for sure. My hospital job has forced me to get flu vaccine. How am I not immune yet? How do you know you're not? <laughs> I'm, why, why do you say you're not immune? Do you keep getting flu? I never. I get vaccinated every year. I never get influenza unless, I mean, now and then I get a mild common cold, a sore throat for two days, sniffles, and it goes away. Maybe it's a mild influenza. But I think I'd like to know why you think... Uh, you're not immune. I know a case of a vaccinated person got infected and transmitted by. Now, how do you know they transmitted it to their son? Was their son only at home and contacted no one else? Did they get virus from both and sequence them to prove it? This is a very high bar of proof, and you just don't know that. And this is the kind of data that we need to be careful of, drawing conclusions when they're not justified. How about boosting need after full course immunization with lesser effective vaccines? Yes, I think that's reasonable. So if you've got a vaccine with, you know, 50% efficacy, by all means, get a different vaccine. You could call it a boost if you want, but I'm, I'm, I would just say get revaccinated. Yeah. In the UK, hospitalizations are increasing in the double vaccinated. Are you sure? Are you sure about that? Um, I, I need to see the numbers. I don't want to just hear they're increasing in the double vaccine. I want to know exactly what populations you're looking at because it can make a difference. This is an observational study which can be confounded by variables. If you're focusing on the hospitalized people, you, you, you're biasing your study. You can't do that. So be very careful. This is what happened in Israel. They made such conclusions, and they were confounded by other variables that they didn't take into account, and they're not always correct. I agree. I call them extra doses, not boosters. I don't think a booster is, because we don't know if they're boosting anything except antibodies for a short period of time. Yeah, there was a vaccine trial in the UK, right? The... Um, I think it was the AstraZeneca that gave people a lower dose and they seem to do better, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly right. And that probably is related to the paper I showed you, yeah. A any reason, results regarding the number of COVID reinfections? Uh, I think they're very low, you know, single-digit percentages. Is there a good chance that if you had COVID, you may be immune for life? Immune to what? Severe disease, death, possibly. Yeah, I mean, it's only been a year, right? So we have to wait and see. But stay tuned for sure. What do I think of the British government's handling? Well, um, it depends where. So Wales, who I had it, Catherine Moore from Wales who was in charge of laboratory testing. They did a great job. They rolled out enormous numbers of tests and they really had a handle on it. But that wasn't the case in other parts of, of England, right? Um, but I think the emphasis on vaccination has been very good, but they haven't gotten everyone. And 
that's the case here as well. So I think um, part of some of some of the, I've been very critical of their responses to the to the variants. I think they contaminated much of the world's news by panicking people about more transmissible variants when in fact they couldn't tell if it were people getting together without masks or actually a virus uh, variant. And we still don't know the answer to that. And we won't until the lab studies are done. So um, it's a mixed bag like everywhere else. If I had been in charge, what would I have done? I, I would never be in charge of anything except my lab and the incubator. There's no way that I would. But if I had been in charge, I would have had people mask from January. I would have rolled out great tests from the beginning in large numbers by engaging industry to make the tests, not just one single source. Um, I would have done more extensive testing as a consequence to trace the infection. Uh, and I would, if I had been in charge before, I would have had antivirals ready for this. So presumably I was in charge before the outbreak and I would have had an antiviral that could have been used to stop this from the beginning. But that's why I'm not in charge because n nobody wants to do that. Does the flu vaccine induce B and T cells? So according to, so it depends. So if you use an unadjuvanted flu vaccine, the memory cells are poor. There's a paper by Rafi Ahmed. And from Ron Fouché, I learned a few months ago, who was on TWIV, that T-cell responses to flu vaccines are really poor, which probably would explain why you could get sick. You don't have a high uh, effectiveness of flu vaccines. So why is that? That's a good question. I mean, it's old technology. The inactivated flu vaccines are made in the 1930s, 1940s, right? And we need to do better. Now, you, we do have flu mist, which is this infectious virus vaccine that's sprayed in your nose. But that's no better in terms of um, effectiveness. I always have a problem picking effectiveness, efficacy, and efficiency. Efficiency is not even on the table, but for some reason it sticks in my head. So the reason they, they suck, we don't know but they certainly need to be fixed. And hey, maybe an mRNA vaccine, an HA and NA mRNA vaccine will do it. We'll know. That would be great. That's why you should stick around to learn all this. Okay, so if HHS has this phone number, which Daniel has mentioned. Thank you. Eurico has, Eurico has published on the other viruses in tonsils. Okay, I didn't see them, but we used to talk about that. Delta Pro Max, is that like the new processor from uh, Apple, M1 Max? Cool, very cool. A large contact tracing study, no contacts developed SARS-CoV-2 infection if their exposure to a case patient occurred six days or more after symptom onset. Right. Okay. I, I know that. I buy, I buy that. That's We've known that for a while. A for, it's on the headline. Of course. It's not, CNN doesn't know what else to put on the headline in, with respect to the virus. They have no clue. They just want to get eyeballs. That's all they're in it for. Come on. And it, it explain to me why Sanjay Gupta is on Rogan. Really? He's going to explain everything? He's not a virologist. That's what you need. The speaker before Lincoln, one of the most popular orators of his day, he spoke for two hours, but nobody remembered it. <laughs> I found today that my pharmacy techs enjoy watching TWIV. Oh, that's cool. That's very nice. It's your fault, but I don't think they mind, right? Remdesivir costs five grand in my country. Is there an alternative medicine that poorer people can access? No. Please don't tell me ivermectin because it's cheaper. It doesn't work. Uh, but perhaps soon there will be, but cheaper, mm, I hope so. You know, the orally available drugs hopefully will be cheaper. I do hope so. 
I've heard from vax hesitant friends that the swabs have EO and it is a carcinogen. What swabs are you talking about? The the diagnostic swabs? No. No, no, no. If they do, it's of a magnitude that wouldn't do anything. Why is Pfizer three times lower content? They just formulated it differently in all their trials. Uh, I don't know the re- the historical reasons, but uh, it it worked in their hands. <laughs> Other than listening to Twiv, what tips can you give people as they search for reliable information? Well, yeah, um, search out search out um, scientists who are communicating. Get, stay away from mainstream media. They they don't have it. I mean, there there's some science communicators who are good uh, over at Atlantic, which unfortunately you have to pay for. You know, Ed Young and Catherine, I forgot her name. They're both good science writers. But find when scientists are writing or talking about issues and listen to them. But it's not easy because they're not the right ones. They're not often the right ones. What do I think about Brazil presidents being brought up on charges of crimes against humanity? Well, that's a legal question. And if it's, it probably will be thrown out, right? Please don't tell me to lay off anyone, Stephen. He doesn't do great work. He's been pushing ivermectin for the last year, which is a crime in itself, okay? I know what I'm talking about. Uh, actually, I, I don't know anything, yeah. So, But I'm not laying off him because his videos are in my face on YouTube every day, and it's BS for the most part. And I know a lot of fans of Campbell here. That's fine. You can be cans, but he doesn't know what he's talking about for the most part. Science closes in on COVID's origins. Um, I don't, I didn't read it. I don't have a subscription to the Wall Street Journal. And I don't actually care what they think about it because they they only, they don't know. The writers don't know uh, really about the origins because if they're considering a lab origin, then they don't know anything because there's ample evidence that it's not. There's no evidence for a lab origin. There's plenty of evidence for a natural origin. So not happening. And pineapples here, pineapples. All right, so this guy is nasty. I hope the mods took him out, the guy who said uh, about Campbell, because he's now insulting Amy. So please, somebody ban him permanently from the channel. Thank you. <clears throat> what mechanism do you think factors most heavily in immune evasion by the virus and accordingly the interferon response. So there are a number of immune evading proteins encoding by the genome. I don't think we can say which one factors most heavily. I think it depends on the infection and I think it depends on um, the person as well. And those studies are ongoing. It's really, really early. And, you know, you want to know mechanistically, we don't have an answer yet. I think there have only been a handful of papers documenting innate evasion so far by SARS-CoV-2 proteins, and I think uh, we don't know the mechanism. All right, let's see what uh, I'm going to spin down through here and uh, check out some uh, super chats and thank them, and then we will say goodnight. Here's Kevin, Kev B. Thank you. Yes, Amy is amazing. Please don't insult her. If you don't understand someone... Don't insult them. Make an effort to understand them. Hello, Ian. Thank you so much. Aspiration. Uh, so I find it hard to believe that you would get all the vaccine in a blood vessel without aspirating. You know, only mosquitoes are good at doing that. But if you intravenously delivered the vaccine, like a mRNA vaccine, it might not work as well because that would tend to be cleared very quickly, intravenously delivered materials, especially particulate like nanoparticles, are cleared pretty quickly. So I don't think that they would induce much of a, an immune response. Anyway, thank you, Ian, for your support always. I appreciate it. 
Oh, here's another one. Mario, thank you so much. <laughs> yes. Uh, I have... So I do. I use the, the laptops on my live streams from the incubator, and there's only two bloody ports, and one's taken up by a charger, and I do need more for the live stream. So that's the new one should be cool for that. I really appreciate it. Okay, Tamara, thank you so much for your contribution. I really appreciate it. Ruzier, thank you so much. Really appreciate your support. And if you didn't have my, if, if those of you who didn't have your questions answered, I'm sorry. I go through them one by one, and then two hours is gone in no time. So come back next week, and um, we could try it again. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you for your support. And we got 349 likes. That's awesome. We had almost 600 people here. I'm amazed. And uh, have a great week. We'll be back next week. And in the meantime, uh, please uh, be safe. Good night, everybody, and thank you.